So my next little bit of advice is that graduate school is really um, where you learn how to be a scientist. It's where you learn how to do research, how to make up your own research questions, test hypotheses, get funding, uh, and most importantly, it's where you learn how to communicate research and your knowledge through doing teaching, uh, through writing journal articles, through presenting your experiments. And communication is really an important part of science. Um, a lot of people don't recognize that in order to be a successful scientist, you really have to be good at telling people about the work that you do, how you do it, and getting them excited about what you do. So for a lot of people, it requires a lot of work and a lot of training to be good at science communication. But some people find it a little easier than others. And in my case, I found it came fairly natural. And during grad school, I realized that I really liked talking about science just as much as I liked actually doing the science. So I had a lot of fun whenever I had to teach a class. I loved making up the teaching material, putting the slides together, and actually delivering them to the students. I loved making posters and designing PowerPoint presentations. I loved writing manuscripts. All of that was really fun to me. So one day, I went to my supervisor. And I said, you know what I really like doing? I like talking about science a lot. She knew I liked talking already, so it kind of naturally fit that I would like talking about science. And so she said, you know what something you might be interested in doing is, maybe you should try your hand at science communication. Now, science communication is a field that I had absolutely no idea existed. But when you think about it, it makes sense. I mean, there are people out there like Jay Ingram, who hosts uh, Daily Planet on uh, Discovery Channel, like David Suzuki, like Bill Nye, that basically get paid to talk about science for a living. So this is another important little bit of advice. There's a lot of aha moments like this, where you realize that there are all these jobs in science that you had no idea actually existed. So I didn't know that you could be a molecular epidemiologist. I didn't know that you could be a science communicator. There's all of these sorts of things out there that we don't even appreciate. And I was in grad school, and I didn't even know these things existed. And theoretically, I should have known at that point, but I didn't. So you know, if we ask people what they want to do when they grow up, a lot of people are like, oh, I want to be a biologist, or I want to be a researcher. And some people might get a little more specific. Like they might say, oh, I want to be a cancer scientist. But you know, there's no such thing as a, a cancer scientist. Here's a list of postings from the BC Cancer Agency. I just grabbed this the other day. These are all the jobs that they have available online that they're hiring for right now. And so you can see there's no such thing as a cancer scientist. There's people that are medical oncologists. There are nurses. There are people that design research studies. There are people that run clinical trials. There are people that are pathologists, radiation specialists. There are people that just do biology on the computer. They never actually even touch you know, DNA or cells, it's all done virtually. There are all sorts of jobs that could be described as a cancer scientist, but really involve a range of different qualifications and a range of different daily activities. So if you're interested in finding out more about particular options within a field like cancer biology or infectious disease biology, it really helps to talk to scientists that are working in an area that you're interested in and doing stuff like going to BC Cancer, going to BC CDC, looking at their webpage, seeing what sorts of jobs are posted there and what are the qualifications and skills you need to get that job. So back to science communication. <clears throat> I still wanted to be Dustin Hoffman in Outbreak wearing the blue biohazard suit, but I thought maybe I could throw a little David Suzuki in there at the same time. Now, grad school was really the perfect time to try this because I still had a bit of free time. I wasn't really fully committed to a science job yet. And as a graduate student, you do earn a salary, but it's a really pathetic salary. So anything you can do to earn extra money is great. So I figured, hey, maybe I can earn a little extra pocket cash with this. So I will explain how I went from lowly university teaching assistant doing grad school uh, to being a TV presenter uh, in one very detailed slide. So first of all, I talked to my supervisor, here's Fiona, and said, OK, well, if I want to do this science communication stuff, who do I need to talk to in order to get a better idea of what I need to do? She said, go talk to this guy, Mark Winston. And Mark Winston at the time was a biology prof at SFU. He now runs uh, SFU's Center for Dialogue. And he is a super amazing guy. He does all sorts of cool projects. And I just thought I'd plug one of his projects that's happening tonight and tomorrow. Um, for a couple of years now, he's joined scientists with modern dancers to come up with a science slash modern dance show. Uh, he did one a couple years ago, and it was amazing to watch. I went to it. It was fantastic. And so the second one that he's working on is actually on tonight and tomorrow up the road at the Scotiabank Dance Center. So if you're interested, you can check out the URL for tickets. 
Uh, anyway, I went to go talk to Mark, armed with a list of questions about, you know, who are science communicators, what do they do, how would I get started? And I told him I had worked at these campus newspapers, the 432, I also did a bit of work at the UBC back as an undergraduate, and he said, hey, that's really great, that's something that you can build on. You know, I had no idea this was going to be useful to me at this point, but when I brought it up, he said, oh yeah, okay, you've already got a foundation there. So he said, try submitting a piece to Simon Fraser University News, kind of the official paper. Anybody in the university community could write an essay and send it in, and if they liked it, they would publish it, and they would give you $250 for it too, which is a princely sum to a poor graduate student. So I sent in an essay. They loved it, and I said, this is great. We didn't have to edit it. It was really well written. We're just going to publish it. Here's your paycheck. So I said, hey, yeah, thanks. You know, would you be interested in me maybe trying my hand at writing some more articles for you? Because this science journalism stuff seems kind of fun. You know, I'll work for cheap, and anytime you have a science news story you want written, let me have a go at writing it. And they said, oh, okay, sure, I'll try it out. And it worked out really well. For the next couple of years, as long as they had a freelance budget, uh, I, every time they had to run a science story, they would say, hey, Gardy, can you write our little science article? So I got to pretend to be a real journalist, and I got to call up the scientists that were being profiled, I got to interview them, write up a little story about their finding, and then I would see it in print, I'd collect my little paycheck and go on my merry way. So that was great. I also got, uh, through my SFE News connections, uh, a couple magazine article jobs, including the cover article of this issue of Small Farm Magazine, which I'm sure all of you subscribe to. Uh, oddly enough, it was a profile of Mark Winston, Canada's bee guru. And then Mark told me about a really amazing program that was going to be starting up in 2006 at the Banff Center in Alberta, a science communications program that he was organizing along with Jay Ingram from the Daily Planet. Um, it just another cheap plug here for a somebody who's now a friend of mine. Uh, Jay Ingram is actually going to be here in Vancouver uh, tomorrow night at Science World as part of the Body Worlds exhibit. He's going to be giving a talk on prions, which are the uh, agents, the proteinaceous infectious agents uh, responsible for mad cow disease. So if you're interested in that, check out the Science World website, or you might be able to talk to the Science World folks here. It's going to be a very cool talk from a very cool guy. Anyway, uh, Mark said, me and Jay and a couple other people were putting on this science communications workshop. You should apply to it and check it out. <clears throat> so the first edition happened in 2006. A bunch of people applied to it and they chose 20 of us to join the program. So I applied using my uh, writing stuff as a portfolio. And we had a super amazing two weeks where I got to do all sorts of really cool science communication activities. And I decided, going into the workshop, I was going to be around Jay from Daily Planet, I was going to be around some television producers. I realized that, you know, if science writing was fun, science television was probably way more fun than science writing. So I made it my mission to go to Banff and somehow get on science TV. So the whole time I was there, I kept bugging Jay. I was like, how do I get to be on TV? How do I get to be on TV? What do I need to do to be a good TV host? Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. And I kept following him around and pestering him, and he's like, okay, patience, patience. One day your time will come. It looks like you might have a bit of TV talent. Here's some Daily Planet scripts. Go practice on these. So it turned out uh, my time did come, and it came actually fairly quickly after that workshop. Uh, CBC Television was putting together a new show called Project X, and they were looking for people to host the show, real honest-to-God scientists. So they contacted the PR departments of a bunch of universities around town, and said, do you have any scientists that would be really good on camera? And can you know, we get the contact information? So one of the guys that was working at UBC and received this email saying, have you got any scientists? He was somebody that had attended that science communications workshop in Banff. So he sent that audition notice out to everybody that was in that workshop group. And I think pretty much all of us sent in an audition tape. And after a little process, we were whittled down from you know a few hundred people to <coughs> maybe 10 or so, and uh, after about three months of auditions or so, I found out I got the job. So Project X, basically every episode we looked at a different scientific concept, things like light or flight or speed or heat, from a couple different perspectives. <coughs> My segment of the show was all about uh, looking at that from the uh, perspective of human health and the human body. So I brought the zero-G clip. Um, I'm going to see if this works. How do I do this? <laughs> oh, you're going to do it from there? Yay. Here is zero-G flight, in theory.
remarkable that a creature evolved to live in 1G can learn how to tolerate the strain of 10 times that much gravity, even if only for a short time. Now that I've experienced the effect of high G forces on the body, I want to see what zero G's is like, total weightlessness. Now the only way to do this without going into space is to take a parabolic flight, and that's exactly what we're going to do today.